Well, welcome to tonight's Slivin General Meeting. The topic uh, for the meeting tonight is uh, identify community priorities. And uh, that's because it's January, the beginning of the year. And uh, we want to talk about um, what kinds of subjects we want to bring forward this year. Now, uh, for this evening's meeting, actually what I'm going to do is um, basically lead this through the use of um, uh, basically a slide presentation where I can scribe information as, um, as people have ideas, because the whole point is to do some um, brainstorming for the purpose of um, introductions in this call. Uh, we'll, we should just do a quick go around the, uh, the the tiles here, where where we live, what town we live in, and um, uh, anything notable about uh, uh, the the recent rains. And um, and I'll start. So I'm Tammy Tracy, and I am the uh, Sliven board chair, and I live in Felton. And I, my comment about the rains is really that um, I've noticed that uh, the rate, when the rains get make the dirt wet, um, old dead trees start to fall down. So we had a, a our, in our immediate neighborhood a dead tree from one neighbor fell on another neighbor's yard. Didn't do any damage, which is lucky, but is that the way things go? Um, I'm Allison. I'm in Felton, up in El Solio Heights Drive, up in the hills. Um, gosh, uh, the rain. Our dog doesn't get any exercise. <laughs> I have to play with him, and I get uh, uh, collateral damage that way. Um, uh, it's affected my ability to get out and about and get uh, get through my uh, chores and appointments and things. Um, otherwise, it's been a whole lot different than it was last year. Uh, it, last year was uh, pretty exciting. This year, it's been actually kind of nice. Hi, I'm Liz Taylor Selling. I am the <laughs> Sullivan Vice Chair. I live in Felton, uh, in Felton Grove. So rain always makes us nervous and we have to keep an eye on the gauges and things like that. Um, I'm also the Felton Area CERT team leader. So that's my Vita for now. Yep, I'm Lynn Dan, half of the Dan and Liz. And, um... Of course, live in Felton, and yeah, really, it, it's the comment earlier about the the raid being a lot more than was predicted is is concerning because this has kind of been a, becoming a kind of a repeating occurrence where the predictions for the river levels are way off and um, the amount of rain is way off. So anyway, that's it. I'm Gwen Logston, and I live in Scotts Valley, kind of in between Felton and Scotts Valley. And I'm a member of CERT. I participate in the Felton team. Hello. Thanks oh, for joining we're us. To talk about, we're supposed to talk about the rain. We if you have like. had no issues with the rain other than it's wet, <laughs> but no trees. No roadblocks, no knock on wood, power outages. <laughs> but that's because I'm all charged up and ready to take care of it. Bracken, I live in Lompico. I think everybody knows me here, but uh, I slipped through the whole thing on the worst part of it on Sunday night. So no problem with the rain there. So. And I'm Todd Gewen. I live in Felton, kind of between downtown and Henry Cowell on the flat part. Um, the The rain has impacted us a little. We've we've got a puppy, 
who's quite rambunctious, so in and out, in and out, and around the backyard, and doesn't care about mud, doesn't care about the rain. Um, but yeah, just so that's that's my experience. It's been pretty pretty mild. Thanks. Very good. And welcome. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's see how this, how I can make this work. Um, that's what I want to share. All right. All right. So this is my little slide deck for this evening. So for the our general meeting this evening, I wanted to actually start with um, like a recap of um, a little bit about who we are, uh, because there may be some folks uh, who uh, are joining us this year who um, don't know all of our history. So here's a, a bit of a recap. Um, Salmon Valley Emergency Network, um, actually, we've been active since uh, 2008. Now, Liz, I'm sure can correct me if I'm wrong on that, because she's giving a thumbs up. And originally, uh, there was an effort to have a program at Mountain Community Resources in Felton, actually, for the San Lorenzo Valley Emergency Network, and it operated that way for um, several years. Um, in 2015, um, we established an independent nonprofit organization, um, basically uh, serving the same purpose but as a standalone organization. Um, the the board for Slippin is um, all volunteers, and uh, so I wanted to let you know who are the current officers of the board. That includes myself as chair, Liz as vice chair, uh, Joe Marie Faulkner, who's um, the treasurer, Dan, who is secretary, um, and other members of our board include um, Allison Hershey, Bracken Andrews, Diana Sue Miller, and Romina Cervantes. And uh, you can become a voting member. Um, members may vote on um, matters that, that arise and do help elect our board officers. Um, it's $24 of annual dues, which uh, can serve also as a tax deductible contribution. And if you're interested in joining us, you can uh, find a donate button on our website, www.sliven.org. And um, the nice part about that donation, it, it runs through the uh, the PayPal application, but does not charge any fees, which is very nice. And notably, our general meetings are open to the public for anyone, member or not. A little bit about um, our mission and purpose. This is our mission statement. Uh, San Lorenzo Valley Emergency Network educates, organizes, and coordinates our community to help prepare for and respond to emergencies, particularly natural disasters and other threats to life and property. And um, that's been our mission since since we actually uh, began this this effort as a volunteer organization. Uh, this is just a list of some of our purposes, obviously to educate and inform the community. Uh, but also to amplify um, activities and events in our valley uh, on subjects that are related to the things that we're interested in, wildfire, extreme weather, road closures, flooding, power shutoffs, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to foster and build and participate in a network of leaders and doers, uh, which are broadly inclusive of individuals and families, neighborhoods, businesses, community organizations, not other nonprofits, churches, camps and schools, everybody who's here, um, we would love to be involved with. Now, a um, couple of highlights from last year um, are um, these topics. Uh, and um, you know the the first one may uh, may resonate with a lot of you. I mean, this the storm stories meeting we held it in April. I believe we attempted to hold it in February, but we were still in the midst of the massive winter storms of uh, 2022 to 2023, as probably many of you remember. Um, and the storm stories meeting that we held in April, I thought was 
um, notable because we were able to recap um, a, a lot of activities that were happening in the Valley of um, people taking initiative to uh, support our community to to make it through. Um, uh, for example, the on Facebook, the SLV Roads Facebook page was born and helped keep everyone um, up to date with all, um, accurate information about road closures and road reopenings, for example. So that was a it was a great meeting to to recap um, a lot of uh, individual collaborative efforts to. Um, help everyone make it through the, those storms. And then in the fall, we put together a meeting that was called the Fire Hazard Severity Zones meeting based on some um, information about uh, maps being developed by Cal Fire um, that were uh, changing the way that uh, the zones are being identified in our valley, and we had a really interesting meeting with some very good guest speakers, including um, one of the uh, chiefs of Cal Fire Sacramento um, and one of our local Felton Cal Fire um, fire captains to explain this map and what it meant, and then to look at the other implications um, for us, including um, uh, potentially insurance and real estate and, um, and, and those subjects. Both of these uh, meetings were recorded and find information on our website, uh, slivin.org, um, including a long list of links for further information and research about um, the topics. So as far as goals for 2024 are concerned, uh, what is this? This must be a little bit too too small to read. Oops, and that's not enough. Sorry about that. Um, frankly, our our goals are a bit under development right now, and one of the hopes actually is the input that comes from this meeting and from the community will help us um, refine and develop our goals as we move forward. Things we know we need to do is we need to make a schedule for our general meetings for this year. Um, there's a question about whether we can actually bring in-person meetings to multiple valley locations, Boulder Creek, Van Loman, Felton. Maybe it's, can we do it in Bonnie Doon? Can we reach out to Scotts Valley? I think we'd like to think about how we could actually um, engage more directly with folks for in-person and then also have our hybrid approach of, of having recordings on Zoom. So we need to develop what we think will be um, good topics of interest for this year. Um, we'd like to have some special guest speakers uh, come tell us about uh, what they're doing and what their expertise is. And generally just do more networking and be uh, with folks in the community across organizations and really uh, dig in together and um, uh, bring forward information and connections that we can uh, utilize well as we move in the future. So with that, I wanna to get to what our subject for uh, this evening is. And that is, I called it identify community priorities. Um, and so, what do I mean? Ident identify, so dream, prioritize, prioritize, call out, clarify. Like, what is it that, you know, is calling us forward? Community is ourselves, our families, friends and neighbors, our businesses and our towns, our leaders, service providers, our elders, our veterans, and anyone overlooked. And what kind of priorities are we looking for? Um, what are the priorities? Here are just some, like preparedness as a priority, resources being available, 
after disasters, like identifying what those are, any emergencies, concerns about emergencies that need attention. And are there gaps or incomplete information that's affecting our ability to react to, respond, um, and uh, manage through all of the kinds of situations that we have here in the Valley. So I hope that that's maybe some, provide some points of uh, inspiration and jumping off as we move forward. And so what I really wanted to do was basically spend some time brainstorming. So I'm going to actually invite you all to go ahead and go off mute if you have some ideas. And what I, I've, I've sort of, I've seeded a couple on this slide. Uh, and they're just uh, starting off points. The first one is um, Santa Cruz County OR3, the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, I think. I think it, I don't know if it's in that or the R's, but anyway. Um, also, it's actually recovery's last. No, resilience is last. <laughs> That's correct. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Never mind. Uh, the OR3 um, is responsible, among other things, in um, running a center that's in Santa Cruz that is. Uh, that does respond uh, to disasters, in, you know, in our county. It is countywide, and they do engage um, organizations uh, like Equine Evac and um, uh, Red Cross and Aries, and uh, you can tell me more about all the groups that they engage with as they do their their work of helping the, the county actually deal with disasters but they there's some subjects i think that are really of interest uh, to us overall one being that uh, i believe last year they um, described an initiative to create i believe they called them resilience centers in um it was think, along those lines yes mm -hmm. uh and it may be that it's the countywide resilience centers but I certainly am interested to understand what they're thinking about for San Lorenzo Valley. So, uh, so then this, this question is, is basically what, so what plans have they begun for creating resilience centers? You know, I would like to be able to get an update on what their thoughts are and have input into what they're working on. Yes, Liz. I think we should invite Dave to come speak to our group. And we can discuss this with him. Dave. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Reed. Yeah, mm -hmm. Dave Reed is the head of OR3. So. So when they say resilience centers, I see resilience as being the, the planning and preparation part for a disaster. Does that mean something else to them or? So I never I really liked these. I think it was sort of. I think it was sort of getting, making sure that a building is up to code uh, to take on people that need a place for evacuate during evacuation. So, for for example, the uh, senior center has just got a grant from the state mm -hmm. to, up, to upgrade their building that they have there to possibly make that for a, a, a resilience center, I guess you'd call it, or mm -hmm. or some sort of, and there's also, they're also considering the library as being one, but I don't know that there's enough space in the library, but they have to go, they have, they have to follow a certain code, uh, which is pretty stringent. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. all that's gonna happen. Sure. I can speak to the fact that um, 
responding to community needs during and after uh, emergencies mm -hmm. uh, can be a varied process and that shelters are not the only answer to meet those needs and uh, sheltering is a very specific process. Uh, so there are other locations where people can get their needs met that are not shelters. And they may actually be more inclined to go to those than to shelters. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear what the county's vision is here. <clears throat> you, you, do you mean a, a place where they can get information and Red Cross information and all that, Liz? Or what do you do? What you okay. Um, just as an FYI to everybody here, uh, the Red Cross is no longer um, responsible for sheltering or any of these activities. They help with the stuff that they help with. But much of this is much of the responsibility for this has been turned back over to the county. Hmm. So that's why we see suddenly the county getting involved in this process. The Red Cross still has a role, but it's not as broad as it used to be. Hmm. So uh, uh, they may be supporting. Uh, the resilience centers, but I don't know that they're running them. So, mm -hmm. again, questions to ask Dave. Yeah. So. And plus, um, they have to get a grant. They have to get a certain grants uh, to do to be able to do this work for these centers that they're thinking of as well, right? Right. So the discussion we participated in last summer or whenever that was, was mm -hmm. to put the grant, to put, finish the grant package and get that mailed. So mm -hmm. one of the questions for Dave would be, where is, where are we in that grant process? Yeah. Do we have an answer yet on whether or not um, we got the grant? And that's something they would talk, have talked about at the, uh meeting at which meeting the emc meeting yeah i don't recall i have yeah. trouble hearing they, they so, did yeah. talk about some grants but i don't know if yeah there's a there's a bunch of different grants that support different activities in the county uh that have to do with emergency response and recovery and resilience so um But the county has been pretty judicious about chasing these grants and often getting them. So, do you remember what the uh, assistant director's name is by any chance? Or to Dave Reed, she was. She seemed no, like it was. Um, give me a second. Starts with a T. Yeah, she was pretty good. I think she. She could even do the talk for Dave, but Dave wasn't available. Yeah, I, I would, I, yeah, I, yes. Um, I just would, uh, uh, you know, if we're going to get any any contact, I think Reed would be the place to start. Yeah. Um. No worries. Um, actually. You also just meant, mentioned EMC, and I, I do think it's interesting, um, you know, there's different groups, and um, I think it would be helpful to know who they are, what they do. So, I think that's a great idea. EMC stands for? Emergency Management Council. And this is a this is a county yes uh, group. county mandated program um, it meaning mandated by the state state yeah yeah um, it brings together um, 
all of the professional groups, representatives from all of the professional groups uh, who deal with emergency response. Mm -hmm. And then it also has added to it um, representatives. Uh, well, anybody can attend the meetings. It's a public meeting. Uh, but there, each of the di uh, supervisorial districts has one representative that is sort of a uh, representative for that district on these issues to speak to emergency issues in that district. Um, I happen to be the person who represents the 5th district, which encompasses the valley. Um, so each district has a person. So there are five people on the EMC voting member who are voting members who are there to represent uh, the public in their district. So I just looked up the uh, the facilitator for that meeting about the um, community resilience center. Her name is Tatiana Brennan. Yes, that sounds correct. Hey. Oh, community resource. Is, is mm -hmm. Community resilience, is that what you said? Community resilience centers. Centers. Thank you. Okay. Sounds a whole lot like community resource centers, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure does. Well, when all the good words are taken up, you know, it's kind of tough. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. I have another question about uh, that was also related to OR3. And that was, um, what well, I guess, three quarters of the way through the year. No, no, no. This is closer to the end of the year, actually. We heard that um, Santa Cruz County uh, was asked to revise their, what they call the general operating plan. And uh, so they asked for- uh, this some, is, It's the emer emergency plan. Yes, it's the emergency plan, but it's interesting because I thought that the document was, it was, it didn't use the word emergency. It, 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 I, uh, I believe it's, it was called the general operating plan. But yes, I I believe that it, it is germane to emergencies and in particular, um, you know, it, I'm curious whether any work was done about looking at um, emergency evacuation routes. Um, may, mm. Maybe there's actually, um, you know, a, a whole series of questions. Um, I think what we're doing thus far for this evening, mm. besides laying the big groundwork, is we're laying out the groundwork for a meeting. And sure. that's fine. Yep. Well, I mean, it's nice to sort of dig in a little bit and, and look at details. So I'm going to flip to the next slide then. So I'll just it will, it will continue on this process unless. So is there anything else that, that kind of relates to OR3? Any other questions mm -hmm. that kind of come to mind for people? So uh, just something on the evacuation routes I'd like to mention. Mm -hmm. um, uh, McPherson and J.M. Brown were working, have been working on that for several years. Uh, the sip, those two uh, people from the supervisor's office, right? So uh, they've been working on doing stuff for Lompico in particular, but okay. I don't know about the rest of uh, SLB, what, what's been going on there, so... Yeah, I've been working with Bruce and JM for about three years on evacuation routes out of Lompico. So. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so maybe the, the question there is, um, what is the status of that? Well, I know what the status is, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm t I'm considering as a whole. 
San Lorenzo Valley, right? Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. quite a few spots that have one way in, one way out, right? So that's well, sort of an issue. Lumpico was rated number four in California as being the worst evacuation. So, <laughs> well, you're going to have to try harder. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But I, you know, I can give you a whole update on that, but I don't think we want to go into that right now. So, you know. Well, um, again, more conversation with David Reed to find out where OR3's role mm. is in this I and what yeah. the status is. I haven't heard anything from OR3 about evacuation routes. Mm -hmm. but it, yeah. There's a political component to that, too. So Yes. That may be why you... There's yeah. been some reluctance to say, you know, here's the evacuation route. Take this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. There's some, so there's some there's some meat here. That's great. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I know that uh, our past uh, head of o of uh, Rosemary had a vision in her head that she was working on executing, but. Um, Anyway, I know that sometimes uh, reactions are situational, and so it's hard to say this is the plan when we don't know what we're dealing with. The plan for debris flow would be different than fires and could be different than flooding, and that's part of the reluctance to lay down a hard and fast thing. So That's right. Yeah, I but, agree. We should find, Dave should tell us that. Allison, I saw your hand. Uh, yeah, a related question uh, that I've had uh, is that now that COVID restrictions are relaxing, uh, I remember during the, the worst of the COVID uh, lockdown, a lot of rules changed and a lot of ways to deal with evacuation and sheltering changed are we going back to the old ways are things sticking around from the covid times uh is there a new improved way to deal with uh people needing to have shelter or evacuate you know are they still con uh, are they still issuing hotel room vouchers for instance things like that that would be a question to ask or3 i think uh -huh. Maybe say evolving post COVID. Well, it comes and goes. I mean, like right now, mm -hmm. people are trying to be careful. Mm -hmm. But in a couple months from now, it'll be more relaxed. Or you might get a new outbreak. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it could be the rules will be permanent. They may decide that it's better to issue vouchers from here on out. Uh, but that's something I'm curious to know. Wasn't it Red Cross that was issuing the vouchers the last time? I think Ask Red again, Cross. please. Red Cross issuing vouchers? For what? Hotels. Shelters. When? During the CZU fire. CZU fire. Uh, and the Your, no, um, Red Cross was issued. Uh, vouchers were authorized by the county, oh. and then the Red Cross was dispersing them based on authorization for individuals. Oh, okay. because Red Cross has the connections uh, that the county has yet to establish. So the way the um, I don't think there was any plan in place for the CZU fire. Uh, there were a variety of sources for vouchers for hotel rooms. 
they just, you know, they got sucked up right away. Um, but during the, uh, uh, debris flow, uh, time, uh, the temporary evacuation point at the high school was the location for the valley and people who were having to evacuate because of uh, concerns about debris flow uh, could come there, get an authorization, and then the Red Cross would match them up with uh, a hotel. Um, the concern during the, uh, at the temporary evacuation point was that, and they had seen this with the CZU fire as well, is that people who were homeless would show up and get the vouchers uh, when they were not, in fact, evacuated, had not been evacuated. Mm -hmm. So the county uh, put a, another system in place that um, people who needed housing assistance because they were evacuated not because yeah. um, homelessness was a constant state for them. Mm -hmm. The uh, county would confirm their address and their location as being where they were, that they had, that they were being evacuated. And then those people would get matched up with how uh, some temporary housing yeah. um so they would have a place to stay until the uh, debris fl flow th threat um, was resolved. Yeah, we could have the uh, have uh, uh, the speaker address how things have worked in the past and what they're planning to do in the future. But yeah, Liz brought up something that might be a related, related question uh, to insert somewhere, which is. How do we deal with the homeless during disasters? Yes. This can be both an asset and a liability. Uh, the homeless, uh, people who've been homeless for a while actually know a lot of resources and uh, resiliency um, strategies uh, that can be, uh, you know, they know where things are. They know... Uh, they just know stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're 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 good informants. So how does the county have a plan for working with the homeless during these disasters? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Is that what did they do? What did they do? Well, that they could go over historically, and maybe they don't know. Maybe this could prompt them to look into it, you know? Right. I, so I've written this as a separate mm -hmm. line item. Not, I mean, it's fine to also have a conversation of, with the county about it. Is it also a, a good general topic of, uh, for just everyone in the valley more broadly? Uh -huh. It can be because a lot of people complain that the homeless will, you know, that there's a homeless person or a bunch of people who re moved their tent to their neighborhood, for instance. Um, uh, they encounter them when, when there, there is some interface going on, you know, uh, uh -huh. especially if uh, yeah. camp has recently been cleared out. And people are casting about for a new place to uh, yeah. uh, to park themselves. And they've also they've also been known to start fires in the area, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not lawnmowers also start fires in the area. So, uh, but yeah, addressing the homeless, I think, can be. 
uh, they really can be an asset, believe it or not. And uh, I'd like to see some way of um, seeing them as a positive uh, effect and, and just including them the way we w might include pets or um, uh, disabled or elderly. Uh, they're people too, and they need to be helped out. And is there anything that we do for them or do we just leave them on, on their own devices? Well, I think um, certainly the city of Santa Cruz found out last year when they opened up the Civic mm -hmm. for in with the intention of providing sheltering for evacuees and in fact got overrun uh, with folks who were chronically homeless. Mm -hmm. And I know that was a, a real eye opener for a lot of the certs and folks that were helping down there. Mm -hmm. Gwen, you want to jump in here? <laughs> yeah, it was it was really interesting. I was very um, ill prepared. You know, I headed out with all of my cert stuff and backpack and you know everything because I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to need. And you know, it. I don't know that there was anyone in there that wasn't chronically homeless, but just having all your stuff there, you couldn't leave without picking it up and taking it places. And backpacks are a pretty prime target for, you know, valuable thing to have. <laughs> so, so it, yeah, it was really interesting. And I worked, I was working with a person that was, um, uh, well, he, <laughs> he, I don't think he'd ever dealt with anyone other than, I don't know, upper class people. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I'm not sure he was even comfortable with me. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but uh, he was just freaked out. And he finally oh. calmed down. He stayed the whole time. And, and, you know, I kept telling him, I said, we're here to help these people. They're not going to hurt us. <laughs> you know? But he was really quite concerned about the whole thing. And worried Definitely. about his vehicle and all those things, but it worked out. There's an interesting side effect here that uh, I think we've glossed over, which is how did everybody know to go down to that shelter? The communications ability, you know, there's a network down there. Everybody knows everybody on the streets. Uh -huh. uh, well, and the other thing is, I believe that, you know, in front of the Civic is a covered area. So it's a pretty well-known place to shelter out of the rain. So, Right. Uh, but there's an, a possible asset there that may help the homeless during a disaster be part of the solution as well as part of the needs. Uh, the fact that there's a network and a, and a knowledge base that they have there um, could be tapped into. Hmm. I'm, I don't know if anybody's ever thought of that uh, or has ever tried that. Um, to what kind of success, if they have tried that, um, counting them in as one of our possible assets may be something to look into and it may actually help them be if they're involved uh they are probably going to be more positive in their own actions uh than we normally think of them you know, because they will feel useful as people always like to feel useful
So I'm wondering, I don't know, maybe connect with there. Is there not a homeless coalition? Todd, do you know if there's a homeless coalition in Santa Cruz? I think there used to be. I'm not sure. Uh, they might be interesting guest speakers. Uh, I know when I was at the Civic, there were some mental health workers and medical professionals that were there that were, they knew everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. they, they would be very helpful, I think. Let's uh, let's move on. Let's mm -hmm. Think of jump to some other ideas. Anyone have some more things? I had just I had dragged these along because they were just general general mm -hmm. topics. Mm -hmm. um, where to get information? That's pretty vague and broad. Uh, really, I um, think yeah. Go ahead. In big letters, not just a website mm -hmm. more and more on tv we hear uh or we hear get, oh go to this website that is not a successful strategy for many people for many reasons so my point is informational diversity is vital to a successful message. And that was just. Uh, and and is, are you specifically related to um, like inequities in access across the population? Across a number of populations, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, homeless. I, uh, I, uh, I have a elderly. lot of elderly people that that's useless for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people who, well, they just have a flip phone. They just have a flip phone because that's the most they like, can. You know, so some of it is financial, some of it's technologically technological. Uh, lack of technological sophistication. Um, yeah. Even language barriers. Yeah. And thank you. And language barriers. Or they have a fancy phone, but no cell phone plan. Pardon? Fancy phone, but no cell phone plan. You yeah. Know, they have to pitch onto a Wi Fi. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Get meals on wheels to distribute uh, flyers to them, or what? Something like that. The, well, it could be. A, hey, there's a, a lot of things idea, you can do, yeah. right? Uh, if because if you had an organization that's already in contact with, um, yeah, you know, sectors well, of the population who, yeah, you know, could use help, and they're already bringing them food. Yeah. That's a really yes. cool idea, which would be to partner with those organizations to mm -hmm. uh, do additional outreach or information. Because it's something yeah. I never thought about in terms of map right. your neighborhood, too, is to map your neighbor's <laughs> ability to receive information. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like in our neighborhood, it's like if you're not on the, the Facebook group, you're pretty much on the outs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Conversely, I've been on the other end of that where the time you have is only to use emails or whatever as communication. You don't have time to sit down and, and remember the outliers who are phone only or whatever. And you so those folks tend to not get picked up so anyway just a comment so um there's a couple of organizations that distribute food to people as well and uh -huh. so i'm sure so, it's not only meals on wheels it's gray bears 
and some other it's pantries ones. yeah sure. yeah so uh, what's the what's the name of the other pantry that's second harvest second harvest yeah second yeah harvest. so if they could put a pamphlet in their bag of food showing emergency contact numbers or whatever i mean most people have phones so mm -hmm. have a phone number. yeah Hey, keep going. <laughs> um, um, I had I had this uh, I, this one. Uh, go ahead. Well, kind of in the spirit of what we we've, we've been talking about, um, I'd like to see a general meeting on dealing in a disaster, dealing with the outliers, people who are special needs, disabilities, elderly your animals, uh -huh. you know, what are the resources for them? Uh, what should you do beforehand to uh, make sure that they're included? You know, like if you have a deaf neighbor, making sure that they can be notified if there's a fire or something like that. Um, well, and it's really even more important to get that information to people before there's a disaster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, also right. you can have it on your refrigerator or wherever. Okay, so sorry, Allison, could you restate what you, what oh, you mean? Like, basically, so how do you deal? How do you include the outliers? Which, you know, I'm including pets too, uh, special needs pets. Uh, old older neighbors, uh, your own, uh, you know, you might have grandma in the house. Um, what can you do to prepare and what can you do during a disaster to, to make sure that they're okay? Maybe we have two or three meetings here, Tammy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. More is better. Let's keep going. So, so yeah, I'll also inform them about, you know, the reverse 911 issue. I think that's probably important. Uh, maybe a lot of people don't know about that reverse 911 issue or, or something that I think they, a lot do not. Yeah. Um, well, and there's a whole Jen, slew of awareness. That's, uh, I think, also Genesis is the new one. The new one, isn't it? Genesis? Gen, uh, Cruise Aware. Actually, I'm going to make yeah, this. Cruise Aware. Uh, Genesis. Cruise Aware, yeah. Genesis well, is actually, yeah. actually Cruise Aware. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's Cruise Aware is the name that the county has given to the company's product. Yeah. But if you go to the website, it's called Genesis, right? Yeah. Uh, Cruiserway.genesis.com. It's that is. You do bring up a point that, you know, companies can spend millions of dollars advertising their products, and, you know have a products on the market for 20, 30, 40 years and still, you know, a good number of the pro population, you know, will not even have a clue that that company exists, even though they market to the public. Yeah. Then we have something like this that is, you know, it's almost like a well-kept secret <laughs> as yeah. much as, as hard as we try. I bet if we did a poll, it would be, you know, eighty percent has never heard, <laughs> never heard of it. Actually, I have, I have a question about Cruiserware. I'm curious uh, because the they had evidently sent out a notification about um, uh, like the the heavy rains that happened um, mm -hmm. earlier mm -hmm. this week or over the weekend, yeah. and I didn't get it. Oh. Well, I saw I saw a reference to it on Facebook. I'm like, well, I didn't get that on my phone. What happened? And mm. apparently, um, 
my account at Cruiserware kind of became, was like deactivated and I had to do a password reset. Mm. Oh, and what? I thought, well, that's interesting. So I didn't get a notice that I had to do a password reset or that I wasn't active anymore. I thought that I had, that it was constant. So I have, I, I have a, I'm going to try to send in a question to ask essentially, how did that happen that I didn't know that I wasn't getting alerts? Well, um, did, did you go into the website after it switched over to Cruise Aware? Oh, yes. Uh, and reset all the data in your in the website yes oh yeah last year i did and then i oh. had like i had selected like email and phone call and text and yeah. so they yeah. were sending out messages like almost like twice a day and everything was going off and it was way too much and so i i, I peeled it back uh but i didn't expect that i'd have to go through a password reset and it wasn't like I got sent an email that said, oh, by the way, that's pretty you're strange. now required to get your password. It's like, oh, no, I just didn't get any messages. I wonder what's did, going on. Did they text you? Because nope. actually I'm not seeing a text from them. Nothing. I, I got a, I thought I got a email. Yeah. I think I got both text and email. High but surf warning on the 29th. But nothing after that. Uh, I, I also believe maybe middle or three quarters of the way through the year last year, a couple of us actually sent an email into the county to uh, talk about how the choices on the website for the things that you were going to get warned about seemed um, yeah. redundant and confusing. wasn't wasn't clear what you would get for the certain categories. So I happen to notice that now when I go to choose categories, it's a lot fewer categories of like, like actually selecting things, which I think is better. Um, so I, I, I tend to think that they may have um, heard us and, and made some modifications. Um, that was actually brought up during a OR3 meeting. OR3? I'm sorry. Uh, EMC? EMC. ABC. <laughs> so another thing that would be good to, to get people that are shut-ins or, or um, disabled is uh, some sort of a, uh, a crank emergency radio, something like that would be good for them to have because they could... They, I think most people know how to turn on a radio <laughs> and listen for emergency broadcasts. At least us older people know how to do that. <laughs> 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 the kids, not so much. <laughs> yeah, well, and again, it, you know, it's sort of like a ham radio. If you just put the batteries in and stick it in a drawer. It doesn't do much good when, when the fats in the fire. Yeah. Need to learn how to use it when it's an easier, uh, a less chaotic time. Yeah. I'm also curious about um, our local radio stations like uh, KBCZ and K squid. Um, and what they think about um, the kinds of communication roles that they play. Mm -hmm. Well, it used um, to be uh, um, KSCO, but I don't know what that status is any longer. I think KSCO sold. Or was for sale, so I don't know if it's continuing that function. KPIG is an emergency radio, I think, as well. KPIG. Hmm. They do the. I think they do the broadcast every once in a while where they click mm -hmm. on emergency broadcast network so and so. Yeah. 
Okay. Another communications question. Um, for a while, I thought that um, some of the amateur radio, the Aries folks, had engaged in a concept of having kind of um, certain locations up and down the valley to receive emergency communications, like when there was a bad outage affecting all communications. And like, um, I, and I don't even remember what, we, what that was called or, or sort of like, where does that stand? Uh, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna kind of turn to Dan here. Do you, you wanna comment a little bit on any of that? Not even understanding what you're talking, what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe it was a, a year or two ago yeah. that uh, Aries was organizing to set up some stations, like at certain yes. locations up the valley. Oh, right. When the power yeah. was out was a, and, and the nobody PSP. had oh, And the PG&E so. was, was going to cut off our power on the chance that, you know, the wind would blow the trees into the power lines. And um, so we had set up a couple of locations where the, the people, the public could go to, you know, report an emergency. And, uh, you know, our part, for our part, it worked okay. I mean, we established that communications link independent of the power system. But... Um, it was also, you know, designed to be in places that would not be expected to have cell service. So, and what, but, what did that um, PSP acronym mean again? PSPS. Oh, PSPS. Which was? Well, like safety power shutoff, I think is what they called it. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. Sorry, one more time. Something's a pu oh, public safety. Public safety power shutoff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was the PG&E name for it. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. One of the things that we were aware of, at least it seemed for the Valley, is, yeah, uh, questions about setting these up, but also questions about how do we let the public know where they are? Because some of the trials that they put in place, and I don't think they did what more than once or twice, uh, they didn't put any I think it was twice and uh, information out. So we didn't have anybody trying to utilize the system. Right. Well, you know, we Aries did its part. And yeah. There's also, you know, there's also a number of other components that have to work together to make this work. And um, but we, you know, we, we did a lot of training around it, you yep. know, specifically, you know, make creating forms and, you know, dealing with the idea that people may show up at your location in a total panic. Mm -hmm. you know, some of the people possibly on this, with injured children with them yeah. or something a couple of so. people on this call actually help provide that training well I remember one at the uh, sheriff's department right on in Santa Cruz where we did all that but it was only in one location that was down there right so mm -hmm. I don't remember any that went throughout the valley here. Yeah, we did the training uh, two or three times at the county. Twice. Twice. Yeah. At the, the, well, county. maybe three times. I can't remember because there was a situation where we planned for one and then it didn't work out. And anyway, yes, because I was the one that was coordinating the actors for that. Um, oh, yeah, right. And so, um, but, you know, then it just, we haven't had a. <laughs> So we sort of got set up for it, and then we didn't have another PSPS. Yeah. Okay. But I think it's a great idea for us to bring this topic back up again. Mm -hmm. I actually...
actually have several questions that I guess I would call related to radio rattling around in the back of my brain. Um, and so um, one of one one idea actually is simply um, um, uh, just you know Air, Aries and, and ham radio gen generally as a, as a topic to bring forward to people in the valley to get mm -hmm. to uh, uh, remind people uh, that it's there or, or and or to find out if, if people are more interested in it like uh, you know talk about what um, what people in Aries do or people who are who are ham radio folks what they do um, Another is actually um, the status of um, the antennas and repeater, repeaters um, because there's oh, I, generally I think that there's been there's been some a lot of change in the last several years of different repeaters that have been in disrepair or repeaters that moved and. Um, mm -hmm. The, the 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 tower that uh, the tower got the empire grade tower that is completing and what its status is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that get burned up? Donate yeah. money. Donate money. It it, it got it, burned it, up and it, then and they tried, tried to uh, rebuild. The neighbors protested and they've been tied up in legal battles ever since uh, well, they've you know, been struggling the, and getting slowly getting it built but they uh it's costing them much more than they originally uh estimated because of the legal stuff mm -hmm. well yeah between the legal and the uh, county mm -hmm. you know it's like oh we want a study to perf make sure you're not in inconveniencing a beetle when, of course, they're replacing something that was there before. So mm -hmm. these beetles were already inconvenienced. All right. Well, that's um, just part of the backstory there, right? But, like, really yeah. what I think is, is significant is that the towers back up and that, you know, we're moving forward. So what So what gets to happen, you know, and, and how does it I, – I remember that hearing that at the time that after the tower burned down that it, it was it was actually also going to affect communications – even for like Cal Fire, um, and you know, with the tower going back up, I mean, this should be a big win for you know not just Avid Hands, right? But um, mm, it'd probably be more of a win for the county, <laughs> ironically, for the county. Sure. Well, if they yes. ever wanted to have another place to put, um, is the the county's you know radio system for like the fire department and the sheriff is depends on, I think four different sites. And so there's just a lot of places that are um, dead zones. Mm -hmm. And they, you know how it is. It's, it's this, this County is not unique, but it is kind of crazy in that we have so many hills and valleys that, um, the radio signals don't want to once they get there they don't want to leave so i i don't mean to go off subject uh, but do those require battery backups those uh repeaters mm. oh yeah they do mm -hmm. so how long do they last do, do we know if there is a power mm, no oh. they only one i really know for sure has been the the AOK -OK repeater in Ben Loman has been like down for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. without power. Well, what most people people don't realize is these repeaters are generally privately owned. Oh. And that doesn't excuse anything, but what it means is government wants to use them but they don't want to provide the resources for them hmm. well 
we would, uh, we would be happy help. if they just got out of the way. Yeah. Oops. Anyway, um, rather than discuss the whole issue here, mm -hmm. yeah, be great to have the guys who actually work on those repeaters come and talk and and uh, tell us about the issues involved uh, and what the pros mm -hmm. and cons are and where they're at with the repeater networks and things like that. Would it would it um, be interesting? Uh, you, how would that help the day to day life of <laughs> the average person well, they, in the valley prepare for the disasters? It can help the everyday person in that they will have more resources to depend on. Some of those everyday persons may have ham licenses. For one thing, um, they might get involved and they might donate some money to the. Uh, uh, to the uh, ECE fund, for instance. Mm. Um, and it's it's good for them to know what kind of infrastructure there is when the cell towers go down. Uh, along those lines, we should put in MERS uh, as one of the... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so meaning uh, the, the MERS radios, the, the little... Just MERS neighborhoods. Because mm -hmm. they're springing up like mushrooms all over San Lorenzo Valley. Yeah, and then we're going to find out that five channels is just not enough. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that'd be great. Let's find out who's using them and uh, and, and and keep pushing it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, more about that. Okay, great. Um. Yeah, I mean, I again, I also agree that just uh, you know more awareness overall, um, people be knowing that there is that there are alternate um, uh, communication paths uh, can be helpful to know mm -hmm. that they exist, and then the better yet is to try to figure out how to now that you know that what are we going to do about it? How do we put it to use? How mm -hmm. do we, how do we create connections into uh, the ham radio people? Maybe people just want to have a radio and listen to the net that, that opens up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. You know, also you can say, uh, you can ask people who aren't hams, identify the ham person in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know where your hams are? <laughs> in the smokehouse. <laughs> yeah, and you have to, to be aware that that there are some hams that are absolutely have no interest in in, in emergency communications. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Other big topics? What do we got? Um, I have a couple. Yeah, I don't want to monopolize here. Um, I'll as always organizing your neighborhood. Just have it as a big topic there um what are all the re uh, all the different clubs you can belong to <laughs> you could be the uh map your neighborhood club or you could be the firewise club or you could be the road association club um i'm sure there are some others those are the only ones I've run across, Allie, and frankly, mm -hmm. uh, Road Association doesn't usually, at least in our neighborhood, it doesn't for isn't formally mandated for this. Our formal mandate is just to do the roads, uh, which means, of course, we're charged with dealing with the after effects of flooding um, and its impact on the road. But mm -hmm. the lines get pretty smudged, especially mm -hmm. in moments of great stress and chaos. To what extent does this bleed over into Allison, um, uh, like social media, like Nextdoor, Facebook? That could be included. Uh huh. Are there others? Next door, Facebook. Um, I 
local radio stations. Um, I included road associations because that's often the only time that, uh, like if they have an annual meeting, that's the only time that neighbors actually see each other. Um, uh -huh. I'm writing discourse, discourse. Th thinking about like <laughs> For the young kind of, people. the student the student genre. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it actually took me a solid thirty seconds to remember mm -hmm. what word that was. Ooh. That brought up another idea: uh, getting uh, high schools involved, um, scouts in high schools. Uh, they're kind of a nexus for a certain. Um, demographic <laughs> it made me think play groups <laughs> that's getting a little young <laughs> <laughs> It would be adorable, though. Uh, another uh, overall topic, uh, just to put a bookmark in it, would be um, can political involvement improve our conditions, uh, improve our resilience, uh, better insurance. Um, and it would be a topic like, how can you get politically involved? Who are our local reps? Um, how do our local reps interface with us in terms of disaster, you know, they often attend our meetings, uh, our public meetings. Um, so like get to know your public reps, um, how they can help in a disaster, how they can help with the after effects of disaster, like for instance, losing your insurance. Well, that is actually uh, something I think the public doesn't really understand very well is that <clears throat> what the role of government, what role does government have in in a disaster, you know, before, during, and after? Yeah. I think a lot of people have expectations, you know, both local government and FEMA that um, – they're going to be made whole. And um, actually, yeah, that was a big deal. Um, something I was very concerned about with the CZU fires and the floods, people were complaining on Facebook about how the government didn't do all these things for them. Um, and they kind of ignored that there were places you could go for assistance mm -hmm. and thought the government should come into their neighborhood and hand things out to help them. Um, so that would be a good educational uh, aspect to one of those meetings. Well, another component that has happened with the fires up here since uh, 2008 um, is that uh, people who have been um, building department scoff laws then expect to be allowed to rebuild the thing that was never legal in the first place? No, even if it was legal. Hmm? I said even if it was legal, then they yeah. run into hurdles that... Um, yeah. Well, that's that's a whole topic in itself. Recovering, yeah. 
uh, wow. long-term recovery from a disaster. We're still dealing with people who can't who can't even put down a foundation. Uh, right. On that property. <clears throat> well, and I think that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that had to do with state regulations. Mm -hmm. Not not okay. county, not just county regulations, but state. Right. Regulations. Well, see, if, if that's the case, then they need to do a much, much, much better job at communicating that so that mm -hmm. we, the public, can try and get that changed. Yeah. Yeah, who do we approach to do the, the to get the changes? Um, a lot of people just don't know. They just see it as this amorphous something, right? That isn't helping me. That is actually, mm -hmm. helping me. you know, and um, no granularity in being able to understand uh what needs to be done in order to get that kind of resiliency and recovery or how to remove the impediments and um some of the, one of the greatest barriers in on all these discussions at this level is that people have to work a job and feed their kids and make their house payments and do all of those things. And they really don't have uh, not just the education, but also the wherewithal to take the what is for them a mammoth step. Mm -hmm. So I see that's an obstacle as well. I don't know how you can put that into words, Tammy, but um, just, well, obstacles to recovery. Okay. Um, I remember when we were recovering from the 98 flood and living in one end of the county and coming back to the other end of the county to try to do our recovery and work jobs. And we didn't have children. I mean, I don't know what I would have done if I had had kids. I guess I would have done a lot less on my recovery. Had a neighbor across the street that uh, got thrown into such a, uh, a heavy blue funk that she basically become became almost inoperable uh, for a year. She just couldn't deal with it. So there's all sorts of things that can um, impact long-term recovery. So the other the other organization is the County Re uh, Co County uh, of Santa Cruz Resource Conservation District mm -hmm. RCD. Yeah, RCD could be helpful in those cases for recovery as well, I think. They have a pretty good website. They do chipping and permitting assistance and all kinds of things like that. So, and they also do uh, uh, some other things like septic and roads and various things. So there's a lot of resources around. If you look them up, you know. Unfortunately, what I found was during our process after the 98 flood was that the process itself is so complex that you really need to hire. And mm -hmm. I'm using the word hire deliberately need to hire somebody to help you with this process. Yeah. So it's, uh, 
long-term recovery is impacted by a very complex process that often needs out, you know, outside guidance. Yeah, I know. Another cost. I know one of my neighbors had to do, they had a slide and they red tagged his house and he had to do an engineering evaluation. So he hired engineers uh, to do it. And it cost him lots of money to do this. And he's still stuck. Yeah. With a cost of more than the house is almost worth. You know, mm-hmm. you have right. to take a loan out for like two or three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know? I it's saw people during the uh, a couple of families in the neighborhood during the rebuild from the 98 flood and the elevation of the houses down here wind up with third and fourth mortgages you know, behind mm-hmm. their first yeah. and and wind up getting the whole project completed, but then having to sell because he couldn't afford to live there anymore. Mm-hmm. That's, so. sort of the pro- that's sort of the problem with insurance is a lot of that kind of thing is not covered by your insurance. You know, your fire insurance or your uh, you have to have special insurance for floods fire, yep. landslides, uh, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. kind of natural disasters are not always covered. So right. You, you got to read the fine print. Yes. What's going on? Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in insurance as an ongoing subject. I think, um, yeah. I think one of the challenges, though, is to try to understand how to, like, what, what aspect of that to um, can be well, basically, what what good can what's like useful and good that can come from diving into that as a subject matter? I keep trying to look at that space for how to optimize how for essentially good news or yeah. strategies or yeah, um, you know what's working. I, and um, I think it goes, it's a little hard to see that. Mm-hmm. And getting our, uh, uh, having to do political action to get our reps to uh, work on the insurance companies or work on getting the fair plan more fair mm-hmm. uh, than it is now. Yeah. Uh, well, fair, well, fair never yeah. meant cheap. And in, <laughs> yeah. So now they they've opened up for big increases for insurance companies, you know. So that's going to be a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was and the negotiation that, that went was, on at CDI. What's his name? Lacar, uh, Lacar, Lacardo or whatever. Our insurance commissioner opened. Ricardo up. Lara. Yeah, Ricardo. Mm-hmm. I, I want to say just one word, Lacardo. Mm. <laughs> but anyway yeah that's a, that's going to be a big surprise for a lot of people when they get their next insurance bill mm-hmm. especially in flood zones or, or um, forest interfaces mm-hmm. yeah well, but as it is now, we don't dare and file an insurance claim for flooding because it would mean our insurance, yeah. you know, go up 10 times. Yeah. Well, any claim is automatic increase in your insurance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for all the damage that we had last year. We don't dare. Well, we're, we haven't submitted a claim because we just. Are concerned that the yeah. the penalty would be too great, It'd cost us more in the long term. For actually, for I mean, it's off topic, but for us, flood insurance is worthless. Yeah, uh, yeah, insurance is a tough topic for, for up here. Right. I don't know. 
I didn't used to feel that way, but now I do. All right. Well, um, we've got a little bit more time. Todd, you ha we haven't heard from you this evening. What's on your mind? What would make a difference for you and your family? Um, I mean, a lot of what I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of things for the first time tonight. I haven't mm -hmm. been, um, you know, keyed into a lot of it until recently. Um, you know, some of the, the prior slides, um, you know, I, I have some ancillary knowledge, um, but you know, a lot of the infrastructure and, for example, the ham repeaters and such, you know, I, I didn't even know that they, we had such networks up here and such. So this has been okay, cool. great for getting kind of an overview of a lot of a lot of what what Sliven's about, <laughs> which is, you know, what what I want to get in here. Um, you know, I, I not being a homeowner in Santa Cruz County, there's a lot of things that I haven't heard about as well of, of you know, flood insurance and such. Well, that's interesting. So are there, and I haven't been a renter for a very long time, <laughs> but having said that, uh, is are there topics that would be useful to renters or things you have curiosity about? Um, I mean, it, 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 in, in evacuation and such, problems. Well, you're, you know, it's specific. You're a little bit broken up. Could you? I can't can think you, of I have something, Tammy, that has to do with renters. Sorry, may, I want to first understand. Um, Todd, I was having a, Not a, problem. A, a hard time understanding you just because it seemed your connection was broken up there for a moment. So I want to make sure I'm capturing. How about how about that? Yeah, I'm having to connect through my my cell phone hotspot, so it's been it can be spotty up here in the valley. <laughs> yeah. Um. I right. I, I can't think of anything in particular that that is a, a renter problem. Um. Okay. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Liz. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh. Here again, I have something to add. Uh only partially because Dan and I are landowners and we have tenants that live down here in the Felton Grove with us. Um, what I observe is I would like to make a, a require disclosure so landlords would be required to disclose uh, natural risks because I am aware in our neighborhood that there have been people who have had the, the property rented to them and it was not disclosed to them that they were in the floodway. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really, as a human being, that pisses me off. Um, I, you know, we put all of that right in the contract up front and it's a discussion we have with any applicant we have for either of the two properties we have. Um, but, uh, also the issue that the room or apartment or house that they're living in will not, you know, if, if they do, if it were seriously damaged they pretty much would just have to move out because it would not have a chance of being repaired right is, uh, is that is that just a, you're saying just more of a practical matter from the, the fact that they don't own the property they don't control it or is it is it more related I, to well that's a, that's one aspect of it mm -hmm. uh the other aspect you have is landowners or landowners who will uh rent out properties knowing they're putting 
tenants in harm's way mm. because the landowner is not of uh, is in violation of standard safety issues. We have people in our neighborhood who have enclosed areas that are downstairs and rented them out. Meaning that the tenant is living in the floodway. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Other property owners have uh, gotten their clearance on their building, on their elevation project, and then proceeded to uh, make changes that are in violation of those, of those permits, mm -hmm. hence putting people and in harm's way, putting rooms downstairs, uh, do just... Just all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I just stuff that I find reprehensible, and mm -hmm. I've done everything I can do at my level to to uh, make appropriate reportage. Obviously, our properties we don't do that on, and uh, but anyway, um, so I feel like. Um, Tenants don't necessarily know their rights in this situation mm -hmm. and uh, or uh, they're so um, oh. so desperate for housing yeah. that they will uh, accept less than safe conditions. Alice, can I see your hand? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um communications between renters and their uh, landlords vis-a-vis -vis safety and uh, disasters. Having a plan for notifying each other, you know, for keeping in communication, uh, addressing issues that may be uh, important to the uh, other party. Our landlord disappeared after the Northridge earthquake. Yeah. Never saw him again. We Free didn't have communications with our landlord. We only sent our money. So the topic is how to talk to each other, landlords and tenants. What kind of things do they need to communicate to each other in case there's a huge earthquake or the fire or whatever? Is the tenant on his own? Does the tenant need to call the landlord and say, guess what, your house is about to go up? What? Um, also, Tammy, behind that, Having I might put something like abandonment of responsibility. In short, slumlord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. That's no, no, well, okay, so, but, but basically, that's, it's, that, 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 and that's a thing, but so, so, and so, what's, having an agreed upon plan between tenant and landlord for uh -huh. if things happen. Okay, communication plan, but, um, you know, rent, I mean, so, like, slumlords, etc. So, like, is that, that feed into essentially renters' rights. I mean, yeah, so. yeah. Exactly. Almost every tenant that we've had in our houses, mm -hmm. at least half of them, have had horror stories of some kind related to their property owners, especially when disasters hit or there's damage to the property, and property owners just basically saying, well, yeah. take it or leave it. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for mm -hmm. coming this evening and participating.
So we've got, we've got what, five pages of uh, brainstorming results. Uh -huh. So um, thank you all very much for contributing to this. This is a great start to get down on paper a lot of ideas. And, um, you know, moving forward is uh, if more ideas come to any of you, uh, please let us know. Um, a uh, super easy way to get in touch with uh, Slivin is send an email. And in fact, it's the info at slim.org. That is a great way to just send us an email with uh, ideas, questions, concerns, um, and anything you want to say. And we'll uh -huh. be here to, to receive. So um, with that, just like to wrap up this meeting. And again, thanks all for attending.